Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Uh, fill us to overflowing with your mercies and, uh, and, share, and build our hearts and build our faith, Lord. And we pray that you would use Pastor Izzy as a vessel to speak to each one of us, Lord, in our walk with you. We ask you now to, to fill us with that Holy Spirit, Lord, that breeze, that touch of your, your spirit to each one of us this morning, Lord. We pray for no distractions, Lord. Help us keep our eyes fixed on you, mm-hmm. the perfecter and, and author of our faith. In mm-hmm. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 4? We got about halfway through the chapter last week, and we saw that Paul the Apostle, um, we were all the way to verse 20 where he said, I wish I could be present with you. Does anyone remember where he was when he was writing this letter? Yeah, he's in prison. (laughs) Of course he wishes he could be with them. You know, he's in jail. But uh, but he says not just that he wishes he could be present with them. He said he wished he could be p- present with them so he could change his tone of his letter because he said, I am perplexed about you. Now, someone wrote to you and said, I'm perplexed about you. Lin- I mean, okay, first of all, wouldn't like little signal, you know, what is it? L- red alert, Will Robinson, you know, danger, danger, something. Hey, wh- wh- what's the problem? I mean, wouldn't you be thinking, uh, this is the guy, by the way, this is the guy who had helped plant the church there, and, and they looked up to him as the guy, you know, spiritual father in the faith and, and an apostle sent by the Lord. And, and he's writing a letter saying, I heard about you guys, and the things I've heard, um, I've got to write and tell you, I, I wish I was there so I could talk to you about this stuff. Now, I can tell Paul is a lot like me, um, and I say this only kind of tongue-in-cheek because I hate to write. If you write me long letters or emails and I write back with a smile and a wink and a thumbs up, <laughs> that's that's me writing back to you. I don't do that part. I would rather have you come and talk to me face to face. I I have a really hard time with communication that is, um, you know, so l- they say that over over 90 percent of communication has nothing to do with the actual choice of words what you use. It's the way that you use the words. It's the way that the, the tone, the, the body language, the whole thing. You could be saying the right words and have the wrong body language, and people will be going, oh, I don't want to listen to that guy. You know, He just freaked me out. And there, there, by the way, I, I hate to say this, but there's even some preachers on TV today that I just, I, I get like, oh, eebie-jeebies, turn that off, man. I, it just, it's, it's not that they're saying the wrong thing. It's how they're saying it. It's how they're conveying the gospel and how they're communicating about the God that created all the things, what we see, the things that are seen and unseen, all from nothing. He made it. And it says, and he gave a gift of his son because he loved us. Now, when you know that in your heart, does it change your life at all? Does it give you, I mean, for me, it's just like, wow, so good. And the, the scriptures that we look at each week, the, the, the Bible that we study through, the Bible says that these words, they were inspired by God's spirit to lead us and to guide us, to teach us. These are words given for our edification, to build us up. And you can't go wrong. So one of the visitors last week came and said, wow, that was really good. You know, like you taught the whole time out of the Bible. <laughs> and... I, I think you should stick around. <laughs> I've been I've been working on teaching this book. I, I have taught this book to this church. Well, we've been here since 1992, my wife and I. So I've had the privilege to do every chapter, every verse, verse by verse, over the last almost 25 years now, um, and t- teach the entirety of the Bible, cover to cover. And now we're back around the whole. I, I don't know if I'll ever make it again, because the first 15 years I, was, I went a little faster. What I, I didn't go as in-depth, so now I'm kind of, s- my wife says we should change the radio show to inching through the word, you know, because you only go a couple verses now instead of the whole thing. But today, I want to show you something that's going to require me actually doing what we call a, a survey style, an overview 
of a, of, of a few Old Testament chapters, and I'm going to do it kind of speedily. So the chapters I'm going to refer to in Genesis this morning, they're about Abraham and Isaac, and you guys know these guys, Jacob, and, and the, 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 there was uh, his wife, Sarah. We're going to do a quick jump from about Genesis 12 to maybe uh, 19. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just highlight some verses. Now, that I'm telling you this ahead of time so you get extra credit. When you read tonight and you're reading, you can go back and revisit it and, and you'll see the highlighted parts I bring out. But the, the reason I'm bringing them out is because most Gentile Christians, how much how well do they know the Old Testament, our, our Old Testament scriptures? They're like, uh, I'm a New Testament Christian pastor. I only read the New. T I don't really get the Old Testament until you explain it. And I'm like, OK, you know, but it really has some really cool things because I was fortunate. I grew up in the Lord under pastors that said the best commentary for the New Testament is what? The Old Testament. And the best commentary for the Old Testament is the New Testament. And I was taught this as a young believer. And so, you know, you want to understand some of the things that are spoken of in the Old Testament? You read the New Testament and it gives you the fulfillment of those verses. You want to understand it the other way? Look at the other testament. You will see it it's all there to help us learn now the the pharisees the religious guys of jesus's day jesus spoke to them in john 5 39 he said you guys you search the scriptures now what scriptures were were they talking about what we call the yeah the torah the 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 old would be our their scriptures the jewish scriptures are just our old testament and and he, jesus said you guys search these because you think if you memorize these scriptures You'll have everlasting life. But what did he say? He said, it is these scriptures that testify of me. And you're unwilling to come to me to have everlasting life. They, they just wouldn't come to Jesus. And so we read in Hebrews 10. It says, it is written of him in the whole of the what? Of the scroll or in the volume. If you have a different translation, the, uh, the modern one says, in 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 the volume of the book this whole thing testifies about jesus the entire book now if you know that going in and you read a story you read a story about abraham was told take your son your only son and offer him on the mount i show you then um that story has a little bit of a different understanding like the jews by the way they love these kind of they call it shadows and types how god foreshadows what he's going to do and and when abraham he's called the father of the faith he went to offer up his son it was a test remember and he brought his son what was his son's name you guys remember he put him on the altar isaac and isaac we're going to study about him this morning a little bit and and show i want to show you something that the commentary for what we're going to study today is right here in this chapter but it, it takes a little bit of learning the story back then and you'll get even more out of today's chapter in the book of Galatians. So I want to start off by reading to you here from Galatians and then jump back to Genesis with you and show you some stuff that might help you. Now, these folks he's writing to, they were a little more um, familiar with the Old Testament scripture. So they didn't really need the whole, you know, walk through those verses. They already knew about them from Paul. So Paul's just going to refer to them. And let me show you what he says. He says, I'm perplexed about you guys. Verse 21, Galatians chapter 4, he says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you, do you not listen to the law? It says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and one by a free woman. Now, the sons of the bondwoman was according to the flesh, and the son of the free wom woman was according to the promise. Now, this is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants that are proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. That one is from who? Hagar. Now, who's Hagar in the story? In the, th back in Genesis day. She was the maidservant of what lady? Sarah. Okay, and by the way, just to keep this, you know, so you keep the, the story understood let me introduce you to abraham and sarah we're always called abraham and sarah they're abram and sarai so if you'll turn with me to genesis 12 i'm going to introduce you to this 
this um, thing that he's referring to. It says when Abram was 75 years old, 75, the Lord spoke to him. He said, go forth from your country. This is Genesis 12, verse 1. Go forth from your country and from amongst your relatives and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make you your name great. And and so you shall be uh, shall sh and so shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you and the one who curses you. I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wow, that's pretty heavy, you know, from that one man, all the families of the earth were going to it's going to get a blessing. Now, this guy right now, he's called Abram. In Hebrew, Abba is father. Abram is uh, like exalted father. It's like a title, exalted father. One problem, how many kids does Abram have at 75? Zero. Nice title, but it doesn't work for me, okay? I mean, it's just not working yet. And in fact, it's not working for him either. He actually mentions this to the Lord. You know, it's nice that you can... Uh, Bless all the nations through me, Lord, but um, I got a I got a little problem here. And so so but the Lord told him to go to this land. Now, did Abram, you guys are familiar with Genesis. Did he leave the land he was in and follow the, the Lord's lead and go to this other country? Yes. And he went to this place what God had promised him. Now, you can read all the extra particulars if you want. I'm just going to survey, skip ahead. And I'm going to show you that in in the end of chapter 14, he has a visit. After winning a battle and, and saving his relatives, uh, you remember he had a, a nephew that got captured. Um, do you guys remember that young man's name? Lot. And uh, saved the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and all these all their people and constituents. And, and they, the king wanted to honor Abram. Here, take all of the goods. Just give us the people after Abram had rescued them all. And he said, no way, lest you say you... You, I won't take even one thong of a, a, a of a sandal, one strap, lest you say you made me rich. My God will take care of me. I love this really interesting. And then this fellow showed up. His name was Melchizedek. Do you guys remember him in the story in the end of chapter 14 of Genesis? And this Melchizedek, king of Salem. What does Salam mean in Hebrew? He peace. King of peace showed up. And he brought out something that we just used this morning to celebrate something. What did he bring? Bread and what? Wine. And he, he presented it as a priest. Uh, it, uh, it says, now he was priest of the most high God. This Melchizedek shows up and he blessed him. He said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. This is, by the way, verse 20 now. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And it, and it says, and he gave him a tenth of all. A Abram tithed a tenth to Melchizedek. And it says, and then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And Abraham said to him, no way. I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. I'll take nothing except what the young men have eaten and share with the men, those that went with me, Anar and Eshkol and Mamre, those guys, let them take their share. But Abram wouldn't take anything from him. He just gave a tent to the Lord and said, take the rest back. Not interesting. Now, after these things, chapter 15 takes place, Genesis 15. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He said, do not fear, Abram. I am your shield to you. And your reward shall be very great. And Abram said to the Lord, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me, since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since thou hast given me no offspring, the, uh, the one born in my house is, is he says, he says, thou, thou hast given me no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, the man who, who will not be your heir, this man will not be your heir, but the one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Nope, sorry, this kid, 
yeah, he's going, I only got this one kid that's born at my house. He's not, but he's not really m- m- my r- blood relative. You know, he's just one of the slaves. And he, I don't have anybody really, Lord, to pass my stuff on, pass my name on to. And the Lord says to him, don't worry. And so he took him outside. Now, I love that. This is one of my, how, probably most of you have heard this first, but for me being a, I'm an outdoor kind of person. I like being like th- if, if Jesus was here, would he be teaching out here on a beach, do you think, like this? Or would he go inside some building? I, th- I think he'd be right right here. He just, you know, he'll go to the building to talk to the religious people. But to reach to the people, the, 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 the regular folks, he would be out by the Sea of Galilee speaking. He would be, you know, he, I could see him right here just preaching away, calling everybody, come, learn of the Lord. And here... The Lord takes Abram outside and he says, look towards heaven. He says, count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Can you imagine you you look up and you see the stars and just, I mean, how do we count the stars? Hold still. I mean, they don't hold still anyway because you guys know if you stay out all night, right, the whole scene slowly rotates and. You get more stars, and those ones over there set in the, just like the sun sets at in the evening, the stars start to set on that side, and new ones are coming up. And how do you count them? You know, and, and he says, you'll have more descendants than these stars. And what was Abraham's, now if God told you that and you had no kids and you're old, what would you think? Like, uh, sure, right? God, you've lost a little bit of, you know, you're going on a little, maybe you're going off base there. You're getting Alzheimer's or something. This doesn't, he, but when God told Abram this, what did Abram do? You guys know the next verses. Most, this is really one of the key pivotal verses in the whole of the Old Testament. Really I- encourage you to highlight verse 6 of Genesis 15. It says, then Abram believed in the Lord. And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. God, you said so. Okay, I believe you. And the Lord said, done. And so he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Ur and of the Chaldeas to give you this land to possess it. And he said to him, and the Lord said, oh, oh, Lord God, sh- how, how may I know that that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a three year old heifer and a three year old female goat and a three year old ram and a turtle dove and a pigeon. So he brought all these to him. And he cut them into two and laid each half opposite the other. But he he did not cut the birds. And of the birds of prey prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram was driving them away. Now, why did they cut the animals in half and lay them a half and a half on each side when they made a covenant back then? Do you guys know this? This is a tradition. Some of these things you have to fill in. You have to learn these traditions. I had to go to Israel to learn this one from one of the Jewish guys. He said that this is the Jewish way of making a covenant. With someone you would take of an animal and you would actually sacrifice it, but you would cut it this way, guys, up the middle in half. So equal halves, you know, the legs on one, two legs this side, two legs that. And you would lay you would spread them cut asunder straight up like this on this way and you would lay them apart and then you would make an oath. And then you'd say, thus be it done to us. And you would walk with that person holding their hand that you made an oath with through the middle of these two, you know, animals that are parted. And I mean, talk about visual. okay? for you visual learners. I mean, this is visual with flies and smells and er I mean, dead animals parted, you know, torn apart in the middle. And you walk between them and you say, let it be done to us like this. If we break this covenant, when you made a covenant, it was a. Well, it was, you know, a contract. And it said it, in the in the scriptures, Ecclesiastes says it's better to not vow than to vow and not pay. Right. I mean, you guys have heard that verse. It's better to not say, yeah, I'll do it. And then don't do it. If you make a vow, it says make sure you pay what you vow. And when you see the seriousness that they took in this, the Lord tells him he's going, Lord, how do I know you'll do this? And the Lord says, OK, get the animals. Get the amp. So you read here. Now, wait a minute. This is if this was between two men, it would be, you know, the men would grab hands and they would walk through and they would look at the animals and say, 
so be it done to us if we break this covenant. But here's what happened in this story. It's really interesting. Let me show you this. Now, it says that Abram tried for to keep the, um, the birds of prey from coming down. What are birds of prey? Vultures, you know, coming to eat on the carcasses. And he's waiting, it says, and he kept driving them away. And verse 12 reads, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And it says, and, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And I will judge that nation whom they serve. And afterward, I will, I will do what? They'll come out. I'll bring them out with many possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquities of the Amorites is, is not yet complete. And it will come about, that it says, and then it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the, these pieces. And on that day, God, the Lord, made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants I have given this land. And from the river Egypt, as far as the great river, that's the, that is the Euphrates. He says the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the, and the Kenamite and the Hittite, the Perizzite and, and Rephraim, all the Amorites, the, the, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. All of that land is going to be for you. But who passed through the carcasses? Did, did Abram? No. A deep sleep fell over him. And God passed through saying, I got it. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's saying, I got this. This, this. You can't even do this. I'll do this for you. Now, he foretold what would happen to Abram, that Abram's descendants would go off being 400 years of slavery and all this stuff before it ever happened. By the way, do you guys realize in the scripture how much God shows off his his foreknowledge, his understanding? You know, we sweat all the details. Like, where we're sometimes now... I don't say this to, to, like, you know, sometimes just the way we're wired, our human nature, we start to worry about maybe what's going to happen next month or next week or tomorrow at work or, you know. I saw a post on by Corey Ten Boom. It said, why do you try to carry tomorrow's worries with today's strength? You already have today's worries to carry. Now you're trying to carry twice as much worry with only one day's worth of strength. It's not... It's not good for you. And so in our frailty, we try to do these things for God. It's a, it's a human flaw in our, in our nature. We try to, we got to help God out. You know, maybe he doesn't know what's going to happen. And why do you think that the scripture has all of these foretellings of what God's going to do and what's going to happen and how he's going to work it all out? Why does he foretell those things? It says it, by the way, in the book of Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel says, I am the Lord your God. I will tell you what will happen before it happens so that when it happens, you will what? You will know that I'm the Lord. Just so you'll know. Now, is it good for us to know that our God has it under control? Is it? Well, okay. All you older Christians, would you do me a quick favor? Oh, everyone that's been a Christian over five years, raise your hand. Anyone over 10? 10 years? Okay, you... Keep your, you guys, the 10 years and plus. Is it good for us to remember that the Lord's got it covered? Like, like when you hear the Lord showing off in the scripture saying, yeah, before this ever happened. Okay. See, this, this thing he's talking about that they're going to go into, into slavery for 400 years. When does that happen? Like, who, who, who remembers that part of the story? Is it, 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 this is Abraham. Well, he's Abram still. He doesn't have any kids yet. Okay, but he's going to eventually have a kid. Abram's going to have change his name to Abraham. We'll get in that minute. And they'll have Isaac. Isaac will have Jacob. Jacob will wrestle with the angel, get his name changed to Israel, or we say Israel. And then Israel will have 12 sons. One of those sons, you guys know the story, 
He shows up in Egypt as a pretty big deal. What was his name? Joseph. I just jumped a whole bunch of time. I just did like four generations away from this story, what we're on right now. God told this before. Four, I mean, this is like saying your great, great, great grandkid is going to go into slavery and then they're going to stay there for 400 years and then I'm going to bring them out and then they're going to come back and all this land from the from the river here all the way to the Euphrates is going to be yours. It's going to be to you and your descendants. And he's going, yeah, I don't have any. But what did Abraham, when God spoke to him, what did Abraham do? He believed God. Okay, God, you say so. Doesn't really probably make sense to his mind, but in the natural, but he, ha you know, this is where faith supersedes the natural. He's like, you say so? Okay, boss. Well, I believe you. Now, I love this story because if you just survey a little farther into the story, you find out that Abram in the next chapter, <coughs> he's, um, well, at the end, I'm sorry, at the end of chapter 16. Now, Abram was how many years old? It says he was 86 years old when, um, oh, I didn't, I skipped the story, didn't I? When Ishmael was born. Who's Ishmael? Ishmael is the kid. Well, this is where Abram and Sarah kind of got a little bit um, tired of waiting. You know, they had been, well, if he's 86, okay, just think this one backwards. You got to go back nine months to for the conception and then. So maybe he's 85. And he was called out of the land when he was 75. So 10 years went by that he believed the Lord, and it didn't happen. So Sarah says, hey, honey, you know, I ain't getting any younger, and neither are you. So let's help God out. You're 85. By the way, she was 10 years younger. She's 75. And she says, you know, we're not really having any kids. So here's my maidservant, Hagar. You go into her. When she gives birth, I'll catch the baby and I'll raise him as our son. Like, symbolically, he'll be our kid. Let's help the Lord out. Because he really isn't getting to the whole thing of we're going to have all the land be ours. And, you know, I can just see him going, honey, the Lord told me. And he's, she's going, honey, you're getting old and senile, you know. Because nothing's happening. Here, let's help God out. Now, this is where the two covenants come from. That Paul is referring to the first one is going to be a covenant where it's not the covenant that is a covenant of promise that that God promised. It's a covenant of the flesh. What Paul refers to as the efforts of the flesh we will help you get it done. God, no kids coming. So just we'll just use our maidservant and, and, and we'll try to help you. And they had a child, Ishmael. And at this point, Abram is 86 years old. And they have this child, and it says in the scripture that he was actually going to be a, a, a wild sort of a man, you know? And he was going to cause trouble. The Lord prophesied, even told about his character. Well, by the time you get to chapter 17, it's funny how the Bible can just jump from he's 86 to how old is he in verse 1 of chapter 17? He's now... 99 years old. How many years is that? Do the math. 13 years. Another 13, 13 years. Boom. Just just between chapters. I mean, they, some people don't pay attention to this, but I find this really interesting. 13 more years go by. Ishmael is now 13 years old. Well, Aaron just said they, they would have had a bar mitzvah for him, right? He, he said bar mitzvah time. He's a young man. And, and, the, and Abram, listen to this was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will establish my covenant between you and me, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of a multitude of nations, and no longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham which is instead of exalted fathers, a father of many, Abba, and then Ham, it, like a uh, huge amount, like father of a multitude is what it is in Hebrew. You're going to be, and I will make you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make 
I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants, and throughout all their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you in the land of, of your sojournings, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. Then God said further to Abram, verse 9, Abraham now, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant and you sh your descendants after you throughout, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which I, he says, you shall keep a, a, between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male amongst you shall be circumcised and, and shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. This will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. This is going to be this covenant. They didn't have to split the animals and say you're going to die. If you break it, this one, you, you know, they, they cut off a piece of the foreskin and they said, OK, you, this is the sign that that you're going to be mine. Now, at this at the end of this chapter, it says that Abram was was ninety nine years old when he was circumcised and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old and he was also circumcised with his dad. OK, and all of the men of Abram's house that were born to him or that were bought with money or foreigners, everyone that hung out around Abram. Guess what? We're having a party, guys. We're having a oh boy. And I look at this. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Then God said to Abram, Abraham, verse 15, as for your wife, Sarai, not Sarah. Sarai was her name at this point. He says, um, Sarai is like Hebrew noble woman, like noble, you know, to, the, for the feminine is noble woman. He says, you, you won't call her. Um, Sarai anymore. You'll call her Sarah. Okay. She's going to have her name changed. Um, this is like uh, to like princess. Okay. It's a beautiful name in Hebrew. So I'll, I will bless her. And indeed, I will give her a son by her. Now he's 99. She's 10 years younger. How old is she? 89. Hey, Sarah. Guess what God just told me? OK, so I, I'm just going to read it to you. Just, just let me. It's it's too good not to. It says then a <laughs> <laughs> I will bless her. Verse 16. And indeed, I will give you a son by her and then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings and peoples shall come forth from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, will a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now, he's laughing. Okay. And Abraham said to the Lord, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. God, what about just let's just use Ishmael already. <laughs> What's the problem here? We got a kid. What was God's response, by the way? Was Ishmael acceptable? Wrong bloodline. Sorry. Abram, Abraham, sa uh, uh, but God said to him, no, but Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for, for, for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. He shall become a father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from uh, went up uh, from Abraham and, and Abraham took Ishmael. And and all of the guys, and that's when he had them all be circumcised. Now, skip ahead to chapter 18. Abram's got to go tell Sarah now. The Lord said, <laughs> we're going to have a kid. <clears throat> circumcision might have done something here. I don't know. But Abraham says to Sarah, I know we're old, but um, and your past childbearing Sarah. But the Lord said, we're going to have a kid. And she laughed. Remember? And as the as the Lord was um, speaking, she was in the tent. Where's uh, where's your wife? The, the Lord had a, a visitor come and I'm not going to tell you about the visitor. That's a whole nother shadow. And type. But the visitor says you're going to have the kid and just re reaffirming. And she, she's in the tent. Now, what's she doing? She's laughing like, sure, right. 
And verse 12 says, and after, <laughs> after I become old, I'm 90 years old, I'm going to have pleasure with my Lord. And be, him being old also, I mean, he's 100. Come on. And we're going to have kids. And the Lord said to Abraham, why is Sarah laughing? Shall I not, in, shall I indeed bear a child when I'm old and so old? And the Lord said, is anything too difficult for me? Now, if you haven't highlighted this verse, you need to. You know, the last, the, 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 the first line of, ch uh, uh, of verse 14 of Genesis 18 says, is anything too difficult for, is this too difficult for the Lord to have a 100-year-old guy and a 90-year-old gal have a baby? Does God go, ha, huh, I don't know if we can do that. I'm only the creator of the universe. I'm only the author of everyone's salvation. I'm only the one that made everything in six. I don't know if we can get an old guy, an old girl to have a baby. Is this really hard for the Lord? No. <laughs> and then it says, at the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year. And Sarah will have a son. And Sarah, it says, denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh. For she, she was afraid, and he said to her, yes, you did. <laughs> he, no, they could, it's a tent. It's not a building. You can hear through the walls, you know. They heard her laughing. You did too. But the Lord had him to name this kid. That they would, by the way, a year later, you guys know the Reader's Digest. Got to hurry to the point now. They, did they have a kid? Yes. They named him Isaac, which, if you know Hebrew, is even funnier. Because Isaac means he laughs. He, like God, got the last laugh. They said, he said, name the kid Isaac, which would be, uh, you, you laugh right now, but I'm going to get the last laugh. This kid is, uh, you know, laughter. He laughs at you. Like God just goes, I'm going to. You know, when people say God isn't have a sense of humor, I said, you just, you don't read the same book I do. Because I just see, I'm cracking up thinking, Lord, you are just having fun with these guys, you know. 190 years old, and then you tell them, name the kid, you get the last laugh. And so they have him. And now, by the way, after they have him, it says that a, an enmity developed between Hagar with her son Ishmael. They started to feel a little uh, insecurity because now there's another boy the boy that was actually born to, not to the maidservant, but to the actual woman of the house. So who does inheritance go to in that culture? If you have these two boys, one from a maidservant and the dad and one that is the real mom and dad, who's going to get all the inheritance in their culture? The one from the real mom and dad, Isaac. And it says, and because of this, Ishmael began to pick on his brother, little brother, Isaac, and and Hagar began to have enmity with Sarah until finally Sarah will say, send them away. They've caused us so much trouble. And, and Abraham will eventually do so. And there will become an enmity between them. Even to this day, the descendants of Ishmael are still fighting against the descendants of Isaac. That's, by the way, where we get all of these guys, the Syrians and the the groups of ISIS, they're all picking on Israel. If you want to do a little who's who in the zoo, uh, you know, trace the, the lineages, you'll find out they all trace back to these two guys, to Isaac and, and to Ishmael, the descendants. But there was one born of a promise from God, one born out of the efforts of the flesh. And Paul, knowing all of this, he says to the church at Galatia, I wish I could be present with you guys. Because I want to know something. How come you guys want to be under the law? Why do you guys want to go back to this, to this situation where you're, you are allegorically, he said there's two women what proceeded from Abraham. One of promise, one born of the flesh. And the one that was born of the flesh, she proceeds from Mount Sinai, and her children are those what, what, what are slaves. She is Hagar. And this Mount Sinai, verse 25 of Galatians 4 says, it, 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 it corresponds to present day what? 
Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But there is a Jerusalem, Paul says, which is from above. And that Jerusalem, is the, that's the one of the promise. She is our mother, Paul says. Rejoice, it is written. Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout who are, who are not in labor. For more are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. He says, and, and, and you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But as, as it is at that time, he who, who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast off the bondwoman and her son. That's what Abraham, you know, and Sarah had to come to. Like, okay, put her aside. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of a free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but we are children of the free woman. Now, last week's study was the beginning of this chapter where it says we have now all become heirs, heirs of God in Christ. We're all, we're going to get an inheritance. But our inheritance doesn't come through Ishmael. Our inheritance comes through Isaac, through a promise what God made and delivered on, by the way. And because of that, Paul says, I'm perplexed. Why are you guys going back to the things of bondage? Now, Christians never do this, do they? They start off in the spirit, and then all of a sudden they go back to the bonds, right? How, how many of you can give an amen that this really does happen? Amen? That It's a sad thing, but true. And Paul is going to tell them, verse, verse 1 of Galatians 5, we just get a preview for next week. It says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. How easy it is for us to slip it back to things what we were enslaved to. You know, when it says when Christ set us free from our sin, he breaks the bonds, the fetters, you know, the chains that shackle us in the things what we struggle with. When you become a Christian, it's one of the most liberating things because you may have been trapped in a in a. Maybe you were you were ad, got like the addictive personality like me. You know, not too hard to get caught in a vice, some some vice that it just easy for you to repeat over and over. And the Lord comes into your life and says, let me free you from that. He's holding you, you know, but you could be whatever drugs, drinking, what, you know, whatever it is. And he says, I'm going to I'm going to free you. I'm going to break that bondage. But I, I've been doing this now almost 35 years as a Christian. Actually, a little over. It is funny to me to see people that I had the privilege to introduce to faith in Jesus 30 years ago, and I hear about them today, and they've decided to go back to the things they once participated in three decades ago. They were freed from these things. They quit using the drugs. They quit drinking. They quit having those problems, and the Lord set them free. And somehow, the enemy just, he's subtle. He like reintroduced the pornography. It just showed up on the, an email or it, 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 it popped up on an ad or something. And all of a sudden, the guy who was freed from all those addictions is, is telling me, Pastor, you got to pray for me. And my marriage is falling apart. My wife caught me and I was looking on the thing. And, and I'm like, wait a minute, you're a guy that had that testimony, how God delivered you from the craziness of all that and he's like yeah it is so easy for our flesh to go back we i hate to tell you this part but you know the story when moses led the people out of egypt they were slaves but as soon as he gets them out of egypt into the promised land where they're safe where pharaoh can't touch we already drowned pharaoh's whole army in the sea as soon as they get done celebrating, they get over to Ai, they, they get there, and all of a sudden they look at the walls of Jericho, and they went, you brought us here to die. There's no food. We're gonna, there's no water to drink. And they start complaining, it was better in Egypt. Leek soup. Oh, I missed the leek soup. A leek soup, give me a break. You know what leeks are, right? Oversized green onions. You love it. Oh, no. 
I hate leek soup. I'm Italian. I like things with substance, you know. Sazitza. There's a whale? Oh, I love it. Get a picture of the whale for the people on the internet. It's way out there. It's okay. Zoom with the camera on the horizon. Right in front of the boat. Oh, yeah, I just saw it. Puff, right there. The boat just right. Okay, just right. I, I'm going to go like this. Because I've been saying this on the radio show. They don't believe me. But this is going to be on YouTube. So it's right there. See, right, th right out there. Just sprayed right out there. It's behind the boat now, straight out, kind of on the horizon. He's zooming with a big lens. He'll get it. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's tough to preach with this kind of interruptions. But, you know. But, uh, yeah, I did tell you to tell me. So thanks, thanks, Lord, for showing off your handiwork. Uh, I'll continue preaching. <laughs> hey, I came from Arizona. We have all the sand, but we just don't have that. The water. That's life to a desert rat like myself. The Lord is, is the Lord good or what? You go to church and you get to hear the word and you get to see whale show too. I mean, talk about blessed. We are so blessed. Come closer, whale. You know what? We'll sing uh, some of the praise songs where the girls do the echo because they seem to like the girls' high-pitched voice. Oh, there's another one over here? This is even better. All right. Let me just wrap this up so that we can get this on. <laughs> And there it goes. I prayed this would happen <laughs> right at the conclusion. Okay, now pay attention, guys. L watch the whale, but listen to me, okay? <laughs> oh, sure, she says. <laughs> no. Try. I'll try, okay. The sad part is, guys, in the spiritual realm, after the Lord delivers people from their bondage, there's a strange part of our human nature it says, you know, we were comfortable in bondage. We didn't like it, but it's kind of weird. It's it's like what we were, f familiarity is somehow, even though it's it wasn't good for them to be slaves and be, you know, they've all f forgotten about the mud and the bricks and the, all the beatings and everything. And they're going, it was better but leek soup. Sorry, you that loved it. <laughs> I'd be like, forget you. Because when they got into the promised land, the Lord fed them with manna. And he, and well, no, the manna he, he provided a, a, out there in the wilderness. And he gave them quail. He took care of them. And they're going, it was better back there. I, I listen to some people talk about their, their experience before they were Christians. They're like, oh, my B.C. days before Christ. My B.C. days. Back then, man, I was a real, you know, hipster. I was a partier. We had so much fun. And it's like somehow the devil has made them forget all the hangovers, all the barfing, you know, passing out and hitting their head and the bruises and the trip to the hospital and the stupid stuff. It's like they glorify those days as those party days were great. And I'm like, you're deceived. What's great is being able to party without having to be hungover. To be a Christian and have the joy of the Lord and his peace in your heart. And not have to try to get blitz so you forget all the pain of your week or the bills or the pressures and you just have to bury yourself with alcohol and numb yourself out with drugs. It's nice to have a God who if I got a problem, I can say, here's my problem. I give you my problem. Cast how many burdens it says on the Lord? All. I can just hand them over to him and he trades me. My burdens for his yoke. Do you guys know that? Jesus said that. You know, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest for your soul. He says, you give me your problems, I'll give you rest. You give me all those things you're worried about, all those cares, I'll give you my yoke. The yoke was the thing they steered the oxen with. It was, I'll give you my steering. I'll direct you. I'll trade you my direction through this course of life for all your problems. Anyone want to trade? Is that a good trade, by the way? We give him our problems, and he gives us his direction. I'm like, how can you lose with that? But to think, oh, it was better back then. You are foolish. Somebody deceived you. But it's our human nature. And by the way, if you've ever taught that, you're in good company. 
The whole church at Galatia was doing the same thing spiritually. It was better back then. We should go back under the law. Yeah, yeah. Paul says, I wish I was with you. Now, next week, we'll pick up right here with this thought. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Not so you'd go back, but so you could go forward. And we want to, we really want to herald that message next week, that Christ came to set us free from this stuff. Because there's some people really struggling that are in bondage even right now in our society to things, and they don't know the freedom that comes from Jesus. And it's going to be, I can't wait for next week to do this, because this part, this part is just, it truly is freeing for our spirits to know what Christ accomplished for us. The promise is what he did. It's allegorically like the promise of Isaac toward us. And it's not in the things of the flesh. It'll be the things of the spirit that will set us free. So next week, come bring a friend. If you have any that, that you know are struggling with things, that they're in bonds, the, 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 the portion coming up will really, hopefully they'll have an ear to hear it. It'll free them. And, it, and for those of us in Christ, it just gives us a good reminder to stay walking in that freedom. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that we have your scriptures to testify of your son. We have your scriptures to point us toward him and his work. And as we get ready to leave this place, Father, I pray we would learn from the letter to the, to the church of Galatia that you want us to continue in the things of your spirit, not in the flesh, not to try to do works of the flesh, but just to honor you and see you work. And we, we thank you, Lord, that you'd even give us whales to be in the background today. As we gather in this place, Lord, we're so grateful we have the freedoms in our country to study the Scripture right out in the open. Lord, for as long as we're allowed to, let us continue to point people to you, to see them uh, encouraged in their faith. And we pray for the ones that would pass by, that they would, they would hear these things and be drawn to you and to, to a faith in you. Lord God, we thank you for our dear sister Phaedra and the testimony of what you've been doing in her life. And we pray for her, for, for her fiancé, and for, for all those, Lord, that we, we care about. We want to come to know you, that they, they would have people around them to show them your love, your grace, your mercy. Fill us with your love and grace. As we go from here, Lord, we celebrate you. And what you've done. We ask you to just lead us now and guide us in the power of your Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless. <laughs>